Hi everyone and thank you once again for tuning into Fizz Cluster Care. What we're looking at here today is another Audi instrument cluster. This time it is from a Mark 1 Audi TT. And I'll do a teardown on this as well as repairing that middle LCD screen too. So first up what we'll do is we'll power it up on the bench just to see uh, what the health status is like on that middle LCD screen. All right, so looking at that, it doesn't look too bad, uh, except you can see that there are a few lines missing within that screen, so that's definitely going to improve once that LCD has been replaced. Now, if you guys haven't seen how, I, how these test rigs are made, it's basically uh, some parts that I got off a red car and I've got a little uh, power control unit that I hook it up to. So basically I've got the blue plug which is mainly the power plug and the green plug here which is used for K-line communications. This other one is for a B6. So if you guys want to see how that's been made please let me know and I'll make another video right up on how to make a little bench rig. It's super simple. On the other end, you've got some power, ground, and also the OBD cable. So yeah, I can show you how that's made if you really want me to. So moving on to the instrument cluster teardown. Now with these instrument clusters, they're a little bit more fiddly to get access to in the car. You've got to remove some panels. Whereas in the S3 and A4, it's quite simple. There's one panel to remove. Whereas in the TT, there are a few more panels to remove before you can access all of the bolts to take it out. So first of all, we'll get our T10 Torx. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six of these little screws to remove. So they can be a little bit tough especially if they've never been taken out before. Let me just sort myself out with a longer tool here and a better grip. There we go, that's a lot better. So T10 Torx is what you need. Now with these last two, that little leather trim piece is sprung. So what I like to do to prevent the piece from pinging off is I like to hold my thumb here in this spot so that the spring doesn't coil back too quickly. And I just leave that screw in its little eyelet. There we go. Once that's off, that can be removed and just placed away. Okay, so now that's done. 
the front housing can come off. There are these two main holding clips on either side that you can pry up very easily and remove the face. Now removing the cluster board from the housing, you've got to press, I find it's easiest to press down on the connectors here and then that'll release it from the rear housing, nice and easy. There we go, put that away. Now this next part is one of the trickiest bits and that's removing the needles. So you've got to be super careful here that they come off um, as straight up as possible so that you don't wreck the motors. So these clusters need to be torn down all the way before you can get to that middle screen. They're a little bit more finicky to repair versus the S3, the A4, uh, VW, Mark IV and Bora instrument clusters. But hopefully this tear down and rebuild can help you out. <clears throat> Removing the foils, there's these two little locking tabs. There's no way else to take it off other than force it out. But it just clips in anyway when you go to reinstall it. So that's the foil off, nice and easy. Then next bit is to remove these two locking brackets, which lock down the two side LEDs and also removing these motors. So there are the two big ones and then the two small ones here that need to be removed. <clears throat> so what I like to do is I've got these really thin tweezers, which I find are most helpful for doing this. So there are these like uh, mobile phone repair tweezers that you can get. So really thin tweezers and you'll see why. So to remove the two side motors, I like to put the tweezers in this little gap here. In the gap, oh, sorry, lighting isn't the best. In the gap there. And then you're able to spread, spread the arms of the little bracket that holds the motor onto the post out and lift each side up. So it's a little bit tricky me holding it up close to the camera, but hopefully you can see that by doing this, it opens up the arms on the motor enough so that you can lift it up over its locking tabs. Just do the other side. So with these big ones, you can do one side at a time. There we go. One. Let's do the other side. Oops. Sometimes if you don't lift it up enough, it does tend to snap back into place. All right, now with the smaller ones, it's kind of the same thing, except they are a little bit more finicky. So this is where I always kind of get scared. Uh, so placement of these tweezers, I like to place it right here. There's a little gap um, towards the tip of these uh, locking arms and I push the spine end of the tweezer in 
to spread it out and then again lift one side at a time. So I'll try and show you that. Hopefully you can get a good view of what's going on. So you can see there compared to the other side that there's just a slight spread of those arms which gives you enough clearance to lift the motor arm out over the little hump of which helps to lock them in place. Okay, now try and show you that as well. Okay, there we go. So you can see here on this side where I've lifted it up a little bit. Now I've got to do the same thing on that side and gently wiggle that motor out. So again, you've got to be super careful here not to break these arms because once these arms uh, break, you've got to replace the motor. They won't sit correctly. Or once the post breaks, you'll need to replace the whole front bracket there, which is not going to be cheap. Oops, there's one. So you can see that I, I have to maneuver the instrument cluster around quite a lot just to get good visibility. Just um, play around with the different angles you find you'll get used to it once you've done a few and you'll find the best technique for you. For me, I just you know, try all different angles so that you get, I've got a good view of what I'm doing and I try not to be too forceful with anything either. But at the same time, you can't be overly gentle. You do need to have the right amount of pressure to get things moving the way you want them to go. Okay, this one's... Don't want to come out. Lovely. There we go. Done. So now that the four motors have been taken out, these brackets can now be pushed out and removed. So this is super easy. All we've got to do is push these legs past the PCB and then they're able to be pushed out. Nice and simple. So you can see there, where are we? That's starting to go down past the board, whereas on the other side, the tangs are fully locked. Now again, you do have to be super careful with all the components on the back of the board. You can see that there are a lot of little chips around everywhere and um, it is vital that none of them snap off during this process. Cool, so now that's all gone. I'm just gonna hold these in place. There are a couple of locking tabs here, one, two, three, four, that you just got to push past. And then the whole front frame can come off. That's just snapped itself back together. So you can see I'm just pushing that past. 
here. Same thing on the top. Uh, I'll show you that way. So you can see exactly how it goes. There we go. Front comes off. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just making neat little piles here of what I'm doing just to stay organized. So I'll just take pictures here so you can see exactly what my little setup looks like. And I just make you know, these piles just so I know where everything is. Now it's time to remove the old screen from the board. And so what I like to do is unlock it here first, lift it up, push this towards where the speedo would be. And then that part of the screen is then free from the frame. Now it's time to get some heat on here to get that old LCD out. When going in to remove the old LCD, I like to use an SMD heat gun. My temperature here is 400 with the fan speed medium. Just wait for that to heat up a little bit. And I find this is the gentlest way, the most effective way to get these off. Using a soldering iron can be done, however, it is super messy. And I generally don't like doing it that way. So it's good to get one of these SMD heat guns to be able to control the heat a lot better and concentrate that heat on the tracks. And you're less likely to damage the board this way or make any shorts. Because you can see that there are a lot of other little contacts nearby where you do solder down that ribbon. So what I like to do after making a few passes is to lift the rest of the ribbon up and then I concentrate on one end of the ribbon and I find that it does start to lift up on its own. Once that starts happening, Just move along towards the other end of the tracks. Done. Heat gun can be put away. Now we get to cleaning up these traces. So generally what I like to do is add a little flux, add a little bit of new solder and then start to prep the replacement screen. Now since we're not going to be using this one anymore, I just prime up my little flux pen Get some on there. Get some new solder. Whoops, it's tangled up with the mic. <clears throat> and just do a little bit at a time. So some of the old contacts are coming off from the original screen, which is fine. It's all part of the cleaning up process. That one there is not looking great. Don't come off. Okay. I'm 
just going to change my temperature so I'm a little bit lower on the soldering iron, it's a little bit hot. So I usually work at 360 degrees. Let's just make sure this trace is not going anywhere. So I've got one here which looks like it's lifting off a tad. But that's fine, as long as that's not come off, we're still good. All right, time to prep the replacement screen. Alrighty, so prepping the replacement screen, you can tell that the TT ones are made for this instrument cluster because the ribbon is offset to the, um, I guess the brains of this LCD. The S3, A3, A4L or A4 ones have this ribbon in the middle of this main section. So what we do now is just prep this as well. With some flux. Oops, it would be good if I had it on, sorry about that. So flux and solder. So I'm just making sure to get solder in each one of these contacts so that when I go to join it to the tracks on the PCB, there's a solid connection. Okay, I just want to visually double check everything on this side of things, which all looks good. <clears throat> now, fitment of this. I like to tuck the ribbon in first, hold that in place just to make sure it's all going to be good. Get some flux on there again. Then go ahead and solder down one end, then the other end, then continue to fix the rest of the traces down in the middle. So ensuring this 51 end goes down and is lined up well. There we go. Now at this stage, my next tip is not to be too hot with your soldering iron. And if you do have a really hot iron, try not to stay in one spot too long. Otherwise, you end up lifting the traces off the board, then you're in real big trouble. If that does happen, the instrument cluster is kind of not going to be usable anymore with an OEM screen. My next best suggestion, if you wanted to use the original cluster still, is to upgrade to a color MFA unit, as it doesn't matter how badly these traces are damaged. When you're using color MFA, as it does bypass the display here, All right, so just making sure that all of the contacts are soldering together onto the PCB. The way that I like to ensure that this is 100% is just visually inspecting that each trace has a nice silver look to it. 
and I'm just running my soldering iron along the whole length of where the tracks would be on the PCB. You can kind of feel when that solder has melted and has made a good connection because it's you can feel that it's flat. Okay, that side's a little bit dry now, so. Just add a little bit more flux and work on the other half. Be really careful not to hit these little SMD LEDs while you're doing this because you are quite close to them. There's only about five mil gap between the soldering iron and the edge of that little light. All right, so I'm just gonna try that again. My lighting here is a little bit tricky and so I've misaligned the tracks. 
but as you can see, it's easily removed to then go over it again and replace. This time I'm going to make sure everything's lined up better than what it was that first time because that was not great alignment. Alright, so I can see that heaps better now. So, hot tip, don't use side lighting when you're doing a task like this. I can see a lot better in the shadow, but the lighting that I've got was very uh, reflective. And so, I, what I was seeing under the bright light was not what I wanted. And ended up in me misaligning the tracks, but now we've got it right. So if I didn't have it right, there would have been a risk of powering on the board and causing a short, which you never want to do. Okay, so just going over this again, you saw me I applied a little bit more flux, but just wanted to make sure that every trace is nice and solid. And I like to do that by ensuring that I can see a nice silver track on each contact here. So we'll just give that a few seconds to dry and then it's time to do a test run. <clears throat> While we're waiting, what I also like to do is lift the screen protector up a little bit. Oh my God, it's that cold here that I've got a little bit of mist coming out of my mouth. So I don't like to take this off completely just yet, but just so that I've got clearance here where this is meant to slide in underneath. Lift that up. Do it on this side as well. There we go. And then that can nearly lock into place. Get that to tuck in a little bit. So that'll naturally just press down once the um, frame goes back into place. So that's fine. <clears throat> but let's test this out. OK, 
Okay. There we go. So we can see that is a lot better than how it was previously. So now that that's all working very well, it's time to go ahead and do the reassembly. So before we do that, let's just lock the screen into place. I'm being careful with the with the film just so I don't get fingerprints on the actual screen itself. There we go. I don't think that's cleared the um lock. So that's all good. That makes it nice and easy for it to be lifted off towards the end. So now that's all happy. It's time to reassemble everything. The frame. Okay, so things to be aware of is that we don't want to pinch the ribbon here too much and just make sure that the um, white edge of the frame slides next to that ribbon, which folds underneath the screen frame. And it's time to lock down at the four corners. There we go. Just make sure the alignment of these is correct. Great. Bring back the two side LCD locking plates. Make sure everything snaps into place and that these tangs at the bottom go all the way through you should hear it all kind of click together. And if it doesn't click, uh, there is a risk of having these displays not working properly. So if you find that you have put the instrument cluster together and the, the characters here aren't displaying right, you've probably not locked these down all the way. Simple as that. Okay, so time to reinstall the motors. So you can see the way that I have put these on my work table was in the exact same order that they came off. So this we placed here. And because that front frame has been locked in, there's no risk of these moving as you push the motor into their homes. Okay, this is a bit difficult to show you, so I'm just gonna maneuver this so you can see that those two posts line up, then that can simply be pushed down and locked into place. Same thing with the little ones, line up at the two posts there and the three legs. And these ones, you have to really make sure that they're locked down well. So again, you'll feel, you'll feel them click once they're all the way home. Again.
Okay. Front foil back on. Now, this is where we can lift this side up a little bit. Here you just gotta click them into place. Up the top, we'll just get that to clear. On the side, we'll get that to clear as well. Lovely. And then this clicks into place. Okay, so now with all of the other instrument clusters, we wanna be putting the needles on when there's power to the cluster. So that's when the motors reset back to their start position. So, to replace the motor, I'm just going to get on top here, so sorry if my head blocks the way. But, as I've said previously in my other instrument cluster teardowns and rebuilds, having power to the cluster is the most integral part. Otherwise, you'll just be guessing and most likely when you reinstall the cluster back into the car, the gauges are going to be off, which is not ideal. Okay. So often the coolant and the fuel needles are quite hard to push on for some reason. Um, sometimes they're not. So what I like to do is ensure that I'm holding on to putting pressure on the back of the motor there so it doesn't push through. The big ones, it doesn't really matter that much. It's mainly the two smaller ones up the top. Okay, so these two side ones, it's pushing on quite easily. <clears throat> Okay, lovely. So that's looking good. All right, so time to pop the rear housing back on. So I do have to disconnect the power cable. And that should Press in nicely. Let's make sure that's all clicked in all the way. All right. So again, with the TT instrument clusters, before putting that front face on, it's good to power these up so that the needles, the coolant and the fuel needle hit their zero because more often than not with the power gone, they kind of lean back towards um, the bottom of the instrument cluster. And so when you're trying to put this front face on, which I'm going to clean up because I've got some fingerprints off it. Uh, if you try to put the front face on without power to the cluster, you're going to squash the needles under the edges here of the front frame and you don't want that. So you want to give power so that the needles shift to their zero position and then you place your um, front face on. But let me just get some isopropyl alcohol. Now I just wanted to clean up the front housing clear glass just to make sure that when I reinstall it, there's no fingerprints on both the inside and the outside. So now that's cleaned up, it's time to remove the clear protective film from the screen. And with the instrument cluster still powered up so that the needles are in their zero position, you can click the front face on. Now just a little tip for when you're placing the front face on, you do want to make sure that those two tabs on the side are clicked 
all the way down so that the housing is 100% snapped back together. Now I'm just removing a little piece of tissue there that seemed to be stuck in between the clear perspex and the ring of the housing. So now that's all nice and clean, you can see there the screen's functioning well. Now we're almost there guys, so we're going to have a look at this little leather trim that helps to cover the screws that fix the cluster into the dash. So you can see that there are two sides of this, there's a top and bottom and where my fingers are right now there's like a little uh, tubing in the trim and that part goes into the little slot in the instrument cluster and the sprung section with the two eyelets on the end are at the bottom of the instrument cluster. So to install the two screws I like to do one side first where there's no tension on that sprung piece. Following that once the screw is in I like to then insert that uh, hard plastic trim piece where that white tubing is into the bottom of the housing and that usually will slot in just a little bit of side to side movement will get it in there. Finally, I like to move that eyelet along, hold the tension down with my other thumb so that the eyelets line up and then you're able to insert that final T10 screw in and screw it down. Now these can be a little bit tricky, especially if you get the screws crooked. So you've just got to make sure that when you are screwing them in, they're going in vertically into their holes, otherwise the housing will start to spread apart. So once you're happy with the trim screws, go ahead and reinstall the other four T10 torque screws into the housing. Nice and easy here, so I'll just cut to the chase. Time to do one more hardware test before it goes back to the customer. There we go, so you can see all the needles are resetting themselves. Everything did a little bit of a jiggle. And that screen's looking excellent compared to what it was before. So that is all good. So once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. This is Ian at Fizz Cluster Care. Now remember, if you do like my content, please remember to like and subscribe and I can make more tutorials and teardowns. Let me know what you want to see and we'll see you next time.